Welcome to the Workology Podcast, a podcast for the disruptive workplace leader. Join host Jessica Miller Merrill, founder of Workology.com, as she sits down and gets to the bottom of trends, tools, and case studies for the business leader, HR, and recruiting professional who is tired of the status quo. Now here's Jessica with this episode of Workology. Welcome to a new series on the Workology podcast that we are kicking off that focuses on the future of work. This series is in collaboration with the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, or PEAT. You can learn more about PEAT at peatworks.org. It's important to walk a mile in another person's shoes. I encourage this often when it comes to understanding the job seeker journey and certainly when talking with employees, whether it's through focus groups, surveys, or even applying for jobs at your company to understand firsthand what the applicant process is like. That's certainly true when we talk about employees with disabilities, whether it's the job search or the work environment. It's important to talk to adults to understand how we can make the workplace more accessible for everyone. Welcome to the Workology podcast, where we continue a series on the future of work. This series is in collaboration with the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, or PEAT. Today, I'm joined with Sassy Outwater Wright. Sassy is the director of the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. They provide vision rehabilitation services and community partnerships to eliminate barriers and create opportunities for people who are blind or have low vision in both work and life. Prior to her work at Mavi, Sassy worked as a blind excusician, an audio engineer. She found that the music industry was largely inaccessible, technology-wise, and set out to change it, establishing the first collegiate program to teach recording sciences and music technology to blind musicians. Outwater also spent 15 years in the digital accessibility field since then, and she's consulted for small business, has helped make products and services digitally accessible. Sassy, welcome to the Workology podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Can you talk a little bit more about your background? Because this is, this is fascinating. So <laughs> walk us through, like, how did you, to, to get to where you are now at the, um, as a director of the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired? How did that all happen? Um, my background first was as a musician, and as I started studying music, I realized that I was too much of a nerd to just get up and make pretty music. I wanted to know how that music got from the instrument to people's ears. So I started studying the science of microphones and recording technology, got into audio engineering, decided that that wasn't quite sciencey enough. I really wanted to know about the physics of the equipment that I was using, so I got into microphones. And during this process, I realized that the businesses, the technology, and the people I was interacting with to try to get you know, a, a, my start in the music industry were not accessible to people with disabilities. Traditionally, we view musicians as sitting in the studio, not sitting behind the control room, and certainly not sitting in the laboratory where these products are manufactured to record music. And that's what I really wanted to do. So I set out to start looking at some of the barriers that were within science and technology that were keeping me from doing what I wanted to do and try to get rid of some of those barriers so that I could do what I wanted to do. That led me into assistive technology and digital accessibility for myself. And as I got into it, I realized how many people were not being served by the traditional models of digital accessibility and assistive technology. Um, women were disadvantaged minority groups were disadvantaged. There were a lot of people who needed access to these new developments in technology that couldn't easily get to them, especially people with multiple disabilities like myself. I'm totally blind and I have neurological disabilities from brain tumors. So <clears throat> I really wanted to deeply investigate the user experience that a lot of people and groups were going through with regard to assistive technology and how they apply it to their daily lives, such as career goals or just life daily living goals. And that brought me eventually to the Mass Association for the Blind. I was fascinated by how age and the disabilities that come along with age intersect with low vision and, and blindness and how assistive technology is and is not serving their needs. So I was sitting at a summit a couple of years ago that the Mass Association for the Blind, or MAVV as we call it, was holding. The topic of technology was 
prevalent there. And I just remember being fascinated with how this organization was nimble enough to evolve into this space and to try to kind of fill a gap that was being widely expressed. And their way of filling the gap was to put a big question mark there and say, what can we do to fix this? And I remember thinking to myself, I want to be a part of that. And then a year later, they posted a job for somebody to head up that question mark and to start turning it into a reality and actual physical steps to do. And I jumped at the chance and got the job. And that evolved into me being coming the director of the whole program. And that's how I got here. <laughs> wow. Awesome. I want to back up too and just ask you, so you're a musician. What instruments do you play? My uh, studies were in voice. And then I also play harp, cello, piano, and violin. Anything with strings other than guitar. I don't play guitar or bass or anything that resembles popular music. I was a classical music snot. I was uh, going through cancer as a kid and my version of a -a Make-A-Wish Uh, before Make-A-Wish was really Make-A-Wish was to get a chance to go up on stage and see the orchestra and touch the orchestra because I couldn't see it from the audience. So they gave me that. Um, The symphony brought me on stage and let me get on their laps and hold their instruments and find out how they worked and touch them. And then the conductor picked me up and helped me conduct. And that was it. I was kind of a musician for the rest of my life. And that became my driving force. And even though I direct Navi, I'm still a musician. I'm still doing what I do. I just am intersecting that with how technology is used by people. I love how it kind of all comes together. It's, it's a great story. It's kind of weird how it all comes together. It's, I was teaching at the Harvard School of Engineering today. I was giving a lecture on assistive technology design principles and how we think about assistive technology versus mainstream technology and and what the evolution of that is going to look like in the future. And I I said, you know, in in 100 years, we probably won't have any disabilities. Or if we do, they're choice driven, um, meaning that somebody may be blind and chooses not to go through the treatment to get rid of them. And I said, that makes me sad in a way. I'm really excited that humans won't have the pain and the problems associated with disease and disability but there's opportunity involved in that as well. Um, and to many of us, it's a big piece of our identity. It's a big piece of who we are. And it can force a lot of our work and our personal lives and choices and the way we interact with the world. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a good thing. There are those of us out there who think there is good within this as well. And I try to bring that out within my work and just kind of walk right up to the fact that I'm a blind physics nerd who loves technology and science and tries to put them together with human experience. Well, let's talk a little bit about inclusiveness and accessibility. Can you maybe talk to us about what this might mean to someone who, as yourself, who is a manager of employees and also as someone who has a disability? I think to me, this goes back to the basics of diversity and inclusion. And it also just goes back to the basics of of good business. Um, Any manager, their job is to look for their employees' strengths and to maximize them and to look for their weaknesses and support them in those, finding ways to to deal with them. So my job as a manager is to find my employees' strengths, whether they're physical, mental, emotional, or other, and work with those things. So if I'm providing accessible or assistive technology in the environment, you know, or to help them do their jobs. That would just be, to me, right alongside giving them a computer to work rather than a pen and a legal pad. (laughs) You know, we're, we're evolved to the point now where that's not how we do the majority of our work. Most of us use technology to do our jobs and to do them well because technology's easier, it makes our jobs better. So why wouldn't I just work with the bodies that I have and that I'm given and that are best for this job? And if that means that those bodies happen to come with eyes that don't work, it's my job to just put technology in front of them that helps them do their job anyway. It's no different to me to provide assistive technology to my employees than it is to pay the light bill for my sighted employees because all technology is assistive technology if you really want to think about it like that. I like that. I'm, I'm taking notes here and I'm thinking this is a great, all technology is assistive technology and I think that is a good point for us to make. 
Yeah, I mean, like, I don't need light bulbs to do my functions, and I will routinely make fun sometimes of sighted people who do. <laughs> I don't need the light bulb to cook dinner or get dressed or whatever, but sighted people do. And yet, you know, I have sighted people stare at me for taking out my phone and listening to my phone talk to me or listening to my computer read to me. I don't need the computer screen. You do. I can get away with my computer just being a keyboard with no mouse attached and having full functionality but sighted people need screens. So that's why the computer is assistive to allow eyes to work with it. Uh, <laughs> so all technology is assistive. It's designed to work with the maximum number of bodies and physical presentations possible. You previously published an article about your own experiences with inaccessibility in the job application and interview process. Can you elaborate a little bit more on why accessibility matters and what you mean by what employers don't know and what they need to know when it comes to the application process. We don't often think of the application process as being a barrier. We think of the application process as an opportunity to hire the best person. So from a manager perspective, usually, you know, I write up the job description, send it off to my HR department, they post it, they give me resumes, I sort through them, interview and hire. The actual application process is not something that crosses the mind of too many managers. And oftentimes from an HR perspective, it's just you throw it up on a website or two or you know, put it up where, put it out to some recruiters and then walk away. And those who are disabled have to interact with the websites that you post that job advertisement to. And whether those websites are accessible or not has to be forefront of HR managers' minds because you can't get to all of the candidates that qualify for that job position if the application is not accessible. So you're missing out on talent. If your, your ad is posted on a website that, for example, doesn't have good captures, which is the focus of the article that I wrote, and those captures are not accessible, say it's a visual challenge only, there's no audio alternative, there's no two-factor authentication alternative, and all there is is this picture, and you have to you know, identify pieces of that picture to make it past the process and hit submit, then the person who is blind, who is absolutely qualified for that job and might be the best person for your job is going to have to walk away from applying for that job. There's a company out there called Ira who saw this as a barrier and stepped forward and said, well, do something about it. They are now offering you know, people the chance to have a sighted person who can assist them with this process. Too often I have had to look at somebody else like I do in the article and say, can you help me through this process because I really want to apply for this job and I've put in hours of work on this application and now I need to hit submit. Um, and saying to a disabled person, oh, don't you have an able-bodied person around for that? Yes, his name is Stan and I keep him in the top drawer of my desk for whenever I encounter something inaccessible. No, I don't have a, a sighted person available to me 24 seven or I didn't, but now I have Ira so I can just call up an IRA agent. They can look through my phone's camera or the, the camera of some glasses at a screen, look at the, the button, help me get my application submitted, and then I can disconnect. So I do have a sighted person that I keep in my desk drawer for stuff like this, but not everybody has access to that. So it's really up to the HR managers to make sure that when you post a job application, you're posting it to websites that consider accessibility priority and that work with you to make sure that your application is accessible. And if you don't know, go to the website and ask, are you an accessible website? Are you committed to making sure that disabled candidates can apply for my jobs, my careers, because I like hiring the best person and that might be a disabled person. A couple things I just want to reiterate that, that you said. Yeah. First of all, it's not just the career site that needs to be accessible. It is the job board or the job aggregator or the other yes. sites where these jobs are posted on that need to be accessible for people, for everyone. That and recruiters. Recruiters are a big barrier that I see. A lot of recruiters, you know, an HR manager doesn't know that a recruiter is doing this, but a recruiter is screening and a recruiter sees somebody has a disability on the resume or hears that the person has a disability as they you know, schedule the interview and suddenly the job is magically filled and the HR manager doesn't even know that the recruiter threw that bias in there. So when you talk to recruiters who are going out there and hiring for your position, if you are committed to hiring the best person for the job, be very specific. We're not at a point right now where we get to walk away from specifics. I wish we were, but we're not. 
So be specific and say, I want the best person for this job. Disability is not a barrier that I am willing to have you consider for being the best candidate for this job. I want the best candidate no matter what ability they have. I also want to talk a little bit about Ira. It's it's Mm -hmm. because you you mentioned this a little bit. It is through your phone or Mm -hmm. through a pair of glasses that you wear. And then you call up an IRA agent and they can help you do what kinds of things? They can help you do anything that a sighted person's eyes would do for them. So like this morning I had to do a PowerPoint presentation and I was getting really frustrated with how my screen reader, which is what takes text on a computer screen and reads it aloud to me, I was getting really frustrated with how it was reading to me some style and font changes. So I called up Ira and I said, can I send you this PowerPoint file? Can we work together to make sure this looks appropriate for the the people who will visually be interacting with my presentation? And so I emailed it over to them and they helped me just, you know, get the colors right, get the theme right, get everything to make sure that it looks correct and send it back to me. And there you go. My presentation was made much faster, much easier, and I was able to maximize my time and go on to do other things that otherwise I would have had to spend an extra hour or two wrestling with an inaccessible process. You know, I use them to go shopping. If I need to run into the grocery store, if you think about it, all the labels are print in a grocery store. And if I need to just grab grab food for dinner, I don't want to have to wrestle with trying to teach a customer service agent how to best assist me. You know, IRA agents are already specifically and expertly trained to do that. So I don't have to go through the, the process of teaching them every single time I call. I just, you know, grab an IRA agent, go pick out what I need, get myself checked out. Point of sale machines are not accessible. And if I don't want to have to give my private information to a sales agent or have them help me with those screens. Now I can keep that process entirely in my own hands and sign the the screen and hit the right buttons using IRA. I can travel throughout the city. If I need to, to go to an unfamiliar place and have not had training to do that, IRA can navigate me with me safely and see through the glasses what's ahead of me and what's around me and give me that information. I have a, a friend who lived in a neighborhood for 10 years, maybe more, and never knew that on a power box on the way to his house was a picture, a mural of a squirrel eating a pepperoni pizza. He lived in this neighborhood and just never had a, the, you know, any idea that this picture was right there. And it's a big piece of what provides character to his neighborhood. And so he was thrilled to know that there was this mural of a squirrel eating a pepperoni pizza in his neighborhood because he had never had that information. And Ira will point little things like that out to you as you walk around. So it's a really cool technology. And it's what I like about it is it's my time. I pay Ira to give me the visual information on my time. I don't have to ask a friend or family to give of their time. I get to pay for my time to be used the way I need it to be used. Can you talk about how you guys use Ira in the office? Now, you, you guys offer the service to anyone at your offices, right? They, they can call IRA and it's like a bulk purchase of minutes, correct? Yes. So we purchased a, what we call a brick of minutes <clears throat> and all of our offices across the state are geofenced. So anybody can call IRA from our locations and have their minutes covered by MAPV. All of our staff members who are blind or low vision who want the service are given the IRA equipment and can call and they have their own IRA subscriptions. And when they call, they can do anything from sorting, sorting their mail to you know their expense reports, looking at receipts, to traveling if they need to go to an unfamiliar location or into someone's home. Well, we have to do home visits. We have to go to different senior centers across the state or different agencies. And Ira can help us navigate. It can help us read body language when I have to do interviews and I want to know if somebody's nervous or what they're wearing or are they engaging with me and looking right at me or are they looking away i can have ira on in my headphones and they can just be quietly telling me what they're seeing if i'm teaching a room full of students and i want to know who's paying attention who's looking down at their phone who's looking at each other ira can give me that information i love this technology i i think it's, that cool. it's amazing and uh what a great feeling to provide your employees technology like that to be able to to do their jobs to the best of their ability and feel comfortable and confident like i said i you know i pay the light bill or the computer bill for my sighted staff i mean it's just a no-brainer to me that i would pay 
to get the best out of my employees, I pay for the technology that they need to be able to successfully and comfortably do their jobs. That just is common sense to me, I think, that we put in place the things that allow people to maximize their time and talent. Let's take a little bit of a reset here. This is Jessica Miller Merrill, and you are listening to the Workology podcast in partnership with Pete. Today, we're talking about job search and employee accessibility with Sassy Outwater. You can connect with Sassy on Twitter at Sassy Outwater, S A S S Y O U T W A T E R. The Workology Podcast Future of Work series is supported by Pete, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. Pete's initiative is to foster collaboration and action around accessible technology in the workplace. Pete is funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, ODEP. Learn more about Pete at peteworks.org. That's P-E-A-T-W-O-R-K-S dot org. I want to talk a little bit about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And most of our podcast listeners are likely very familiar with the law and, and the concept of uh, reasonable accommodation. Mm-hmm. You told me in preparation for this podcast that one mistake companies make is that they have just a compliance mindset instead of focusing on the best way to utilize the skill set and the abilities of the person, of the employee, who has a dis- disability. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on this? I've always had kind of a personal problem with the words accommodation, um, reasonable accommodation, because to me that says to the employer, you have to go above and beyond or in a different direction to accommodate this employee. Yes, disability is the expense of minority. Yes, we can be hard to accommodate sometimes when the accommodation costs money. But that's just a fact of business, running an operation, is there are expenses involved in that. My very kind of hard and fast line on that is you want the best person for the job. I can't reiterate that enough. Then sometimes you have to pay a little extra. If you you know are hiring the right person and there has to be a salary increase to get that person, you don't think twice about that, but we think long and hard about building in some extra accommodations around the office, like a ramp or you know an ASL interpreter or something. That's kind of ridiculous in my opinion. That just would be lumped in with hiring the best person for the job and they need what they need to be able to do their job, you give that to them if you want the best person for that job. I look at disability when it comes in and I'm hiring somebody who is disabled. It's a variable to be solved for. Like an engineer would, you know, solve for X. We all hear that in high school math class and it it stands true in this instance too. Disability is a variable. It's a question mark and an opportunity. It's not a legal It is a legal mandate, but it's so much more than that. It's an opportunity for a company to innovate. It's an opportunity for a company to diversify and to break some boundaries and some old things that maybe aren't working for that company more anymore. Maybe there's more that the company can be doing to be inclusive and to think bigger and to think better. Because when you generally accommodate somebody with a disability, you wind up doing more for the company culture as a whole, even if you don't mean to. It just kind of naturally happens and evolves like that. One of the things that you also said, and I think about your background and and what you described, how you have this sound engineering and acoustic and musical background and this interest in technology that led you to your current role. So this is a really unique, specialized set of experience and skills that you likely wouldn't otherwise have unless you had a disability. Right. And so one of the things that you said that I I thought was really important was that sometimes it's that special skill or experience like like you've had that is a very important asset that for the organization and and certainly in your career, it has been a defining um, experience that's made you and helped you be an expert on, on the subject of accessibility and this technology that exists or doesn't exist right now. I do a talk for disabled individuals who are getting into the job market and who are applying for work. Um, And I call it the cheat sheet talk of how to interview and get hired when you're disabled. And one of the things I say is (laughs) traditionally there's a lot of fear and a lot of stress for a disabled person going in. They're not going to hire me. They're going to discriminate against me. 
they're going to have questions about how I do things. And that's going to be where the interview is focused on, not about me as a person and my talent. So my responses to that have varied over the years, but I finally, about five years ago, settled on and came to the realization that we can completely flip that. When I walk into an interview now, I walk in in a position of leadership. I walk in with more information than that employer has on me and with a level of expertise that that employer does not have. So in a way, I'm using this interview as an opportunity to teach. Uh, which puts me in the leadership role and puts me in the confident and capable leader role rather than the supplicant, oh my gosh, will you hire me and will you pay me role of fear. And I think when you can walk in with that level of confidence and comfort because you have one thing going for you, you know yourself, you know your disability, you know the accommodations that you need, you know the accessibility features you're going to need. So when they start asking these questions, that's your opportunity to lead and to say to these employers, Having a disability has taught me to be diplomatic. It's taught me resourcefulness. It's taught me problem solving and innovation. It's taught me how to compromise. It's taught me how to lead. And that's just to go to the grocery store to pick up apples. You know, um, I need all of those skills to just interact with society on a daily basis. So when you hire somebody with a disability, you're also hiring the set of skills they have developed to live with that disability in a society that is not designed for people with disabilities. And it takes a lot of ingenuity, creativity, and talents that employers search for to be able to live with a disability in today's society. And that's a hiring plus, but the disabled person has the chance to direct that narrative and to be comfortable with themselves in that body in that interview and to take that leadership role. So it's not a fear-based concern of intimidation and discrimination. It's a chance for us to walk in and say, so here's how this is going to go. I'm an expert in my own body. And let me teach you about what that looks like. I love that point of view. I, I just, I just think that, that you can offer so many great insights to employers, which is why I wanted to have you on the podcast to, to be able to help them understand and then also maybe make that transition once they do may extend an offer to a candidate, help them make mm-hmm. that transition from candidate to employee be more successful. So do you have any advice for employers on how to te- how to do that? It starts long before you know that you're going to be hiring somebody with a disability. It starts now. It starts, and that's whether or not you have a disabled employee working for you. It starts with you, and it starts with every single person at your company. It has to be baked in. Diversity and inclusion and disability specifically and accessibility has to be baked into your company. So you can ask three questions. One, what does my company do about accessibility, both digital and physical? And you can ask that question. You can go to your boss right now, whoever you are, wherever you are in that company, you can go to your boss right now and say, what is our company doing about accessibility for people with disabilities in any aspect of what we do, whether it's for employees with disabilities, customers with disabilities, anything. And you can have the accessibility discussion. The second question that you can ask is what can I do to be a more accessible participant? and to bring accessibility to this company. What can I do to bring accessibility to my company? Um, And that takes Google, that takes going online, that takes listening to podcasts like this, it takes talking to disabled people and finding out from them what their experiences are, reading blogs, finding out more about digital accessibility, physical accessibility, and not just the laws, but the lived experience, finding out from disabled people what is good and what is bad, and I don't mean the caregivers of disabled people or the parents of disabled kids. I mean disabled people. Centering their voices is key to question number two. And the third question is, if a disabled person were to come here, what would they encounter? And again, it goes back to question two, centering the disabled voice. What are they going to need? Have you company-wide built a culture that views disability as normal, as part of the company, as an equal contributing heavyweight member. So for example, if you hire a disabled employee, are you going to measure them by the same performance standards that you're going to measure anybody else by? Or are there some inherent things that you would have to change for their performance review? When you hire somebody with a disability, are they going to have the same interactive experience getting their lunch, taking their break, 
getting through the work processes? Or are there going to be some inherent changes? And there will have to be some inherent changes to the way you do business and the way people work within your culture at your company. But asking those questions, no matter where you are in the process, before you hire, while you're hiring, and after you hire, and then implementing the information you find out from those questions will lead to an accessible, comfortable, diverse working environment. Sassy, thank you so much for joining us today. Where can people go to learn more about you and what you do? Um, they can go to mabvi.org. That's M-A-B-V-I dot O-R-G. They can find me at Sassy Outwater on Twitter. They can find me on Facebook at Positively Sassy. That's P-A-W-S-I-T-I-V-L-Y-S-A-S-S-Y. Um, pause like guide dog pause. And they can find out more information on any of those sites and they can find out more information through Pete Works about how to create a comfortable working environment for people with disabilities. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Sassy says all technology is assistive technology and that is certainly true. It's important to talk to employees who have a disability at your office, whether it could also be a friend or a trusted expert like Sassy, to better understand how you can make your workplace more accessible. I think that sometimes it might seem overwhelming, but the best place to start is right now. And whatever focus or direction or accessible tool or program you choose to implement, the important thing is to start today. Thank you for joining the Workology podcast, a podcast for the disruptive workplace leader who's tired of the status quo. This is Jessica Miller Merrill. Until next time, you can visit Workology.com to listen to all our previous podcast episodes. Production services for the Workology podcast with Jessica Miller Merrill provided by TotalPicture.com.